Welcome, 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 my people, to Empress's studio right here at Stephen Stanley's recording studio where we document Jamaican music. Joining us today is Tommy Cohen. Tommy Cohen, I would say, is a uh, record producer, record promoter, event promoter, MC, a great man who has lived through decades of Jamaica's music. He's going to tell us everything that we need to know from his experience about Jamaica from what, Ska? to rock steady, to reggae, to dance all today, to gospel? And beyond. And beyond. It's a pleasure being here with you, Tommy. Tommy, your musical journey, when did it begin? Where are you from? Hey, I, I oh, where did musical journey begin? Began, um, I think, out in Newmarket, St. Elizabeth. St. Elizabeth, I know Newmarket. You know Kilmarnock? What do you mean? Yes, my mother's from there. Yes, indeed. Yes, okay, let's keep going. We <laughs> from um, Newmarket, um, my father, my mother called it Industrial Park. Mm -hmm. So you had New Market, Industrial Park, and then you had Mokro Happy Grove. Kilmanic was on the other side. Okay. But however, back there in, in, in those days, early days, uh, my father got a, a gramophone from the United States. <clears throat> and this was the most amazing thing, and still the most exciting thing ever happened in my life. What year was this? Oh, gosh. It's about <laughs> <clears throat> it was probably about 1951. Wow. 52. So he got a gramophone from the United States. Right. And did anybody else in the community have a I've gramophone? Never, I've never seen a radio before. Okay. And no electricity. I've never seen anything like that. Mm -hmm. And here's this thing, and a sound was coming out of it. And um, I thought first that there was a man inside it. <laughs> I figured it myself that a man couldn't hold this thing. So I figured they'd cut off his head and put it in. <laughs> and I was curious to find out. So I started twisting around this thing on my father, really. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to say, no, no, leave it alone. And um, this is just how you do it in your place. So we, I think we got about four records. We got um, How Much Is the Dog in the Window. Jane and Louise will soon come home. Irene Goodnight uh -huh. and um, Home on the Range. Four records in the gramophone. Uh, yes. And he got the records with the gramophone. With the gramophone. Okay. Yeah. So I think that was as the early beginning. Okay. And then of course. Um, How did the gramophone work before you got it? I oh mean, man. I mean, a lot of us young people have never seen a gramophone. Okay. <laughs> you know, you have the record, right? The disc, and of course, then the doses was a 33 disc. And um, you had to wind this machine up, like um, you, you, you wind it up, and then you had um, a head and had a needle. Mm -hmm. And anytime the needle gets dull, you have to change it because this record starts sounding funny. But you put the needle on it, and you would hear like Jane and Louisa will soon come, come home. home. Will soon uh, come home. I don't know the will song. Soon soon come right. Home. Okay. <laughs> If, if it if it if it didn't wind it enough, it would go like Jane and Louisa will soon come home, soon come home. Slow, slow. So that was your. Jane and Louisa will soon come so it depends home. on how you wind, wind it up. It up again. <laughs> wow. So that was the first experience. So nobody else in the community had a gramophone. Right. And where, what happened after that? After that, you know, my, my father said, you know, we got um. I, I had to go to Kingston with my mother. She was going to the doctors. So I went to Kingston and found Kingston was exciting. I came back to the country and for some reason my father got a thermos from from wherever, the United States, you know, thermos that you keep your mm -hmm. stuff hot in it. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, if any of you ever break this thermos, I'm going to send you away to Kingston. You broke it oh, quick. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you love Kingston. This yeah. is what you know. Where this, are we? This is um, uh, probably two years after. It's about it's 53. About okay. Right. And so I I got to come to Kingston and I went to half a tree school mm -hmm. and um, started hearing the radio and, and stuff like that, you know, Pat Booze and, and so forth. And um, and so got into it and started seeing like people like Tommy Sands at the movies and some, some things came out and Elvis Presley and all that and I saw later on in, in years I, I saw like little Stevie Wonder mm. and I, I, I love the harmonica and saw Stevie Wonder blowing this harmonica and so you know at Harper Tree School I just whenever they have a little concert try to get involved and you had a harmonica? <clears throat> yes and, and, and singing my Pat Moon songs 
So where did you where did you go to see these movies? What were the theaters oh, around at the theme. time? State theater, theater. Mm -hmm. and um, of course Carib, mm -hmm. you know. So Carib's still around today. Oh yeah. Okay. And um, so one day while I um, went down, I heard of a concert at St. Hughes High School. And I went over there and I did my number. Um, um, April, April Love. It's for the very young, a happening song. Okay. So after I was finished, there's a group of guys singing called the Miracles. And they said, hey, you need to join our group. So you joined the group? Joined the Harmonica group. player? No. Oh, you were. <laughs> oh, you sang at the time. Okay, right. so you joined as a singer. Um, okay. Uh -huh. and, um, I went with Miracles and we did quite a few stuff, talent contests. We, um, we. We also um, entered, um, we did the talent contest and we went over to Sir Coxon's and all of that, mm -hmm. trying to get recorded and we used to do a little nightclub down Maxwell Avenue, mm -hmm. you know, five of us and we wait until two o'clock in the morning and then they put us on and they give us 25 shillings, you know. And you perform. Yeah, they wouldn't put us on to sing until everybody stopped buying at the bar. Oh. So to get the people start buying more. Mm -hmm. They would put us on at that time and so. So you had an energy and the people right. liked you. Yes. So they would buy more drinks. Mm -hmm. and, and so that is it. Then one day, to tell you this story quickly, is that we met a guy who came in from the United States. Mm -hmm. His name was Aston McEachern. And he, um, he had um, a, the, the Jamaica producer boat ship. And we saw this guy driving off on his beautiful pink Cadillac mm -hmm. off his boat. You know? and, wow. So we, we found out something about this guy. And we got to meet him. And um, a, a man introduced us to him, the guy who had owned some club over on the east. And then he would bring us to, to sing for his girlfriend. Oh so yeah. He his girlfriend to spend that dinner and we just see. How much did you get paid for nothing, that? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. So, so that um so he looked at us one day and he said, you know something? I tell you this. One day Jamaican music is gonna become very big in the world. People are gonna recognize it. And you guys need to be the first among it. Call yourselves, forget this the name, the miracles and call yourselves the Jamaicans. Oh. And so we took on the name of the Jamaicans and um, we went on to do quite a bit of songs. Um, you know, we had a famous 67 song, Baba Boom Time. We had Things You Say You Love You're Gonna Lose, which was recently done by UB4. Uh, Peace and Love, Sing Freedom. So the group went on to how long? Oh, we went on for a few years. Um, maybe until about uh, 73, 74. And we still get together every once in a while and do some stuff. Interesting, the Jamaicans. Yeah. So, okay, so the records were made. Did it go internationally? No. Okay. Never, no. It was really a local group, yeah. but had great exposure across the island. Right, yeah. Let me ask you then, um, other things that you've been involved in, such as promotions, uh, events, your own record label, name those for me. Okay. Um, after you know, working with the, the, with the Jamaicans, there was one night um, while on stage, I saw Byron Lee looking at me and said, hey. And then when I came off and said, hey, what you do? I said, well, I was working downtown at Home Electrics, and so he said, no, you need to come and work in the music business. Mm -hmm. And um, I went with Byron, and, um, and we started Dynamic Sound Recording Company. So, uh, after, after that while now working with Byron, I was producing Adina Edwards, and we did Eric Donaldson, um, we did the Blues Busters and, and these groups. Mm -hmm. A Keith Lynn, Vic Taylor and so forth. So I decided at one time that um, I was going to move on now and I decided to open my own company called Talent Corporation. Mm -hmm. So we brought in Junior Tucker. Uh, we did with Junior Tucker. We had um, Russ Michael and the Sons of Negus, Israel Vibration, um, Jacob Miller in a Circle. Mm. And of course, then I was distributing music for Peter Tosh, Bonnie Whaler, and Bob Marley. 
Wow. Yeah, I got two Bob Marley songs, um, Roadblock mm -hmm. and Natty Dread. Yes. So that was Talent Corporation. And then. That's in the 60s? That's no, that's now 70s. Oh, we're going to the 70s. Going to the 70s. Okay. Now. And um, then I started doing the live performances. I thought to myself that we had a talent in Jamaica mm -hmm. uh, that needed to be exposed. Um, in a different way because what, what would happen in those times is that you would go to a show you're given two songs to do if you get an encore then you do three songs mm -hmm. and I thought like boy people like a Lewis it was um, Greg Razak was just coming in and Dennis Brown these guys needed to be seen more hmm. and I started to use that the epiphany the and, epiphany uh, was where? in New Kingston oh. yeah so every Wednesday night I would have a different act or two at the Epiphany and then you could see them perform for an hour mm. and I did that for about two years um, lifting all the equipment up the stairs lifting them back and one night I made some money <laughs> Me, made is that in money. the first year or the second year? Oh, God. <laughs> I'll never forget that and I always say yeah. oh, do you know what? she was the first one that I made a profit from her oh. shows and I couldn't sleep the night Oh. I couldn't sleep. What was Judy doing at this time? Judy was she was solo. She was a yes, solo act. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. At the same time, she was seen as part of the I trees as well. So you made your money, a little money. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> I thought I had to go in this time think full time now, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I stayed there for um, Talent Corporation, producing different stuff, and then I think. Um, what have happened would have happened um, that would have been the heights of this all is going with Bob Marlin doing the, uh, the One Love Peace concert Ooh. when he called me to produce that 1978 yeah Manly and Siaga shook hands right what was going on in Jamaica politically that this concert was so significant uh, there was a divide um, first you had Claude Massa who had gone to England mm -hmm. Uh, to live because, and then you had the the, the, the the guys from you know Bucky Marshall and so forth, and then there's always war in each other in the West. Mm -hmm. And Bob Marley was sort of in exile at the time, too, because Bob had gotten shot at and Bob had left for a long time and was not seen in Jamaica, and so. Between Claudie called and said, Well, listen, we need to do this thing. We're going to bring Bob home and we need you to produce this, this concert. And so we went about doing the One Love Peace concert, um, which in itself has been registered as uh, one of the top 10 best concerts festival of all times in the world. Yeah. Great. And that was a historic time when. We had Mandy and Siaga shaking hands. And if you should look at that film, it's quite interesting because you could see the hand of God coming down on that situation. What what you would see on that film and you would think is lightning effects. It's actually lightning. When Bob went into his spiritual dance, the, the lightning actually well, it's a lightning clap. Mm -hmm. The lightning flashing. Bow, 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 mm, bow. Mm, mm. And he just went into this. The spiritual dance is, is, is hard to explain, but uh, you know, I've seen him, you know, in that kind of a trance from time to time, having toured Europe and so with him. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I saw Bob for like 32 days straight. Wow. And every day I wanted to see him again. I want to pick up on that. You're going to stay in the studio with me? Bless indeed. Yes, let's talk about Bob. Let's talk about the the other artists that were on the 1978 Peace Love concert at the National Stadium here in Jamaica. Tommy Cohen, you are like lightning when we're talking about retrospective moments in Jamaican history. I love it. Bless. <laughs> I gotta get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up.
Wow, it's history and I love, 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 love my history. 32 days on the road with Bob Marley, Tommy Cohen. Wow, what was Bob Marley like? Many people want to know. You had a personal encounter. Oh, discipline. Ooh. That, that's the first thing about Bob, discipline. Bob on tour was the first to be on the bus. He's the last person to go to bed. But I tell you, um, it was amazing. So much so that I remember one morning we were in France and I said to myself, I saw Bob the morning was about three o'clock and <clears throat> we were in the hotel lobby and people were still coming in to see Bob. People were bringing their children for him just to like lay hands on them. Wow. You know? And so I said, okay, catch him now. He's up late. So the next morning I got up very early. <laughs> And I put on my sweat suit and going up a hillside. It was foggy you know, in the south of France. I just heard a voice in the clouds. Tommy Cohen, where do you put this time of morning? Bob. <laughs> yeah. What are you going to do up? <laughs> yeah. And um, he said, Whoa! I said, I couldn't <laughs> tell him why, but I really wanted to be out there before him. <laughs> you know. But it was a good morning. We stopped, you know. And we talk and say to me, sure. You see me? If I was ever six foot tall, I'd be a soldier. But this will happen. The man who breed my mother, you know, is a white man. And I just know my purpose. You understand? <laughs> so we just leave it at that. You know. He was an interesting character, yeah. right? But the out of that, uh -huh. I got that thing in my mind that says reggae music, you know, is a, is it's a movement mm. going around the world to unite the people of all race, class, mm. color, creed or religion. Mm. That was what I got out of that statement because some of the things when Bob speaks, he just stops abrupt and then you figure Left that one out. For you to interpret. Oh yeah, when they were in England one day and they, they, they said to him, we went to a radio interview and, um, and they said to him, hey, how you feel about these, these British groups? Now doing the ska. You know they're all doing the ska music now. <laughs> Good. I did it 13 years ago. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So it was it, one love really. Yeah, it was one love. What were you around uh, you know the days of apartheid, you know when Bob Marley's music was banned, certain songs were banned in parts of South Africa and I think even in Zimbabwe. I know that they were pushing the reggae music there as they still are today, but certain songs I think weren't allowed to be played or sold in those countries what do you know about that? well i was at hope road one night when um when two guys came now hope road we're talking about the bob marley bob museum. marley museum yeah mm -hmm. and we're upstairs because we're usually up there at night cooking porridge okay you know bob taught me one thing it's at night time you, you, you cook porridge mm -hmm. and um and these guys knocked on the door and these are two guys two africans and i said bob we traveled all over the world because they told us you were in England, and then they told us you were in um, Los Angeles, and we went to Los Angeles, we went to Miami, and we are here mm. because we are from Rhodesia. And when we were um, losing the battle, it was your music that won the war. And we would be so honored that if you could come to Zimba, to Rhodesia, when we get our independence, mm. we said, wow. Um, so, all right, how much money you guys have, you know, can bring us over? So we ain't got no money. No. Right. So, anyway, long story short, Bob decided to pay for that, for that trip. You know, it cost him over a quarter million US at the time. That all the instruments flown in from England and, and we went from, from Jamaica. Yeah. When we went to Rhodesia, we learned that in Rhodesia, you could get um, two years imprisonment for having Kaya in your possession, and you could get one year for any other Bob Marley's album. Yeah? And um, because it was just so banned. What year was this, Tom? Oh, this was in, oh. um, this was uh, 79, I think. Wow. Right, or uh, 80. 79? Wow. Yeah. Anyway. And um, so 
this was what was was happening there and and families would tell us that you know they had to bob marley's music was like bootleg and it it was sold for like 25 pounds a copy mm -hmm. it's a lot of money for these people and what they would do families would starve for a week nobody eat that so they could put everything in to buy a bob marley's album but the, the soldiers would tell you the strength that it would give to them. Mm. So when we went there, we had experiences, man. We went into, into the, in the, the jungle mm. where these guys were, and they would clean up the very f ground, knowing that Bob Marley was coming there. Yeah? We, we had guys who laid down their arms. I mean, I've seen arms laid down for Bob in Germany, yeah. east and west side of Germany. Mm. We used to stop our bus there, and they said, Oh, come out. Da, 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 da. Out. Da, da. We found this. Uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers here. They lay their own arms, German soldiers. And wow. walk off and stood up. Yeah. And the same thing would happen, he, uh, I see, in, in, um, and I just tell this. Once we were at a place and um, two soldiers walked up. And they says, they presented arms to Bob Marley. He says, this is, uh, this we call this the Rolls Royce. You keep it clean, and and she 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 fires. <laughs> it's an uh, uh, American M16. Wow! And the next guy comes up and he says, "This we call the Land Rover. It goes through water, it goes <laughs> through mud, it goes over stones." Mm -hmm. It's, it's a Russian AK-47. And they gave this to him? No, they just they, they what they call cause... presenting arms. Uh -huh. And he stopped and said, Ah, American and Russian gun. Which one are you fire an African gun? Yes. And they look at each other and say, oh. <laughs> You know, something's yeah. wrong with his head. Yeah, Africa yeah, don't we, have we guns. We don't have know? guns. We buy but, guns. But Bob was... <laughs> But, but there's a big question, you know, yeah. which one you fire the African gun? Was Bob well read? Because he seems something about Street, that veteran. Street he smart and very deep in the Bible. Deep in the Bible, yeah. he was yeah. like a psalmist. Mm. He, um, as I understood, his, his mother would tell me that one of the things they had to do was to repeat the psalms. But back in Zimbabwe, we had this experience when we went and we put up the stage and, and all of that. Mm. And... Um, while Bob was on stage performing, I think it was about his third song, about 7,000 prisoners broke jail out of the camp, what they call the prisoners of war. Yes. If you imagine the National Stadium and you imagine the, the, um, the National Arena over on that side was this where they kept all these prisoners who fought in the war, but they were still behind the fence and they broke down those fences and they broke down the, 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 um, the, the doors of the stadium. We had people like Prince Charles, all the leaders of Africa there. And, um, and they came through, of course, under tear gas because the police started firing tear gas mm. and the soldiers and all the place was in smoke and they what had to have see you. Bob. I had to wet up Ziggy. Ziggy was there with us as a oh, baby. Yeah. I had to wet Ziggy with a towel and water mm. and some of the well, so Ziggy Marley would have been more, how old would Ziggy have been? Just Ziggy four? was uh, Six, four, four, four or five. five. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and, um, wow. well, <laughs> when the thing quieted down, we didn't see eye tree. Um, there were no way to be found. They ran, <laughs> they ran and hid. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and Bob was just able to do, um, um, Nati Dobitina Zimbabwe. Yeah. And Africa unite, and then the flag started changing. That was so emotional. The flag changed from yeah, from the British flag to then the highest Zimbabwe flag. Wow! And that was, you know. What year are we? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Going back in history, though. But the I three is now. Let me ask you a little bit about Judy Rita and uh, Marcia. Mm -hmm. uh, what were they like? The synergy. I mean, their rumors that you know we know rita and bob had their relationship um were any of the other i3s in love with bob from what you know or saw on the road no no not that you know no how did how, what was the synergy like you know musically with them oh man they were just this I, I, I mean they were one of a kind mm. you know they were these these girls were moving 
Um, they're well always dressed. With, oh, dress? Trust me, because on the road, they, they, they had to be attended to. Mm -hmm. You know, their clothes had to be well every day. I mean, they, they, their wardrobe alone was like a little trailer by itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, man. They, talk about clothing and fashion. Um, you know, music and, and, and fashion. It, they would say it's the order of the day today. Was it the order of the day back in the day? Explain to me how the musicians took fashion. How important was it? Okay. I take you back to a thing called the Christmas morning shows. The Christmas morning shows? Yeah, those are the big shows in Jamaica okay. in the days gone by. And every Christmas morning, you had several shows. The Ward Theatre, Carib, State, Regal, and there was another theatre in Halfwich, I don't remember. Not Odeon. There was another one for a while I was there. But that one Christmas morning, I think we had like six shows and one. And what would happen on a Christmas morning is that not only the artists were so dapper, because Jamaican artists were dapper. When you look at the guys like the Blues Busters or the Alton Ellis's or the Derek Morgan was known for his hat, mm -hmm. you know, Roy Shirley was known for his big color, color mm -hmm. you know. Um, the Blues Busters um, dressed alike and Byron Lee and the Dragonies and all these groups. But not only them, the audience that came, I mean, people were specially dressed to come to these shows <laughs> with their top hats, okay. their walking stick, and, uh -huh. yeah, man, and, you know, their boots and stuff. The Christmas morning. Yeah, man, How I long mean, did this last? Oh, man, this went on for years and years. 70s. On. It, it went on from the 60s, 60s into the 70s. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. And then somehow it died out. Uh, let me ask you, some of the artists that were on these Christmas morning shows, you mentioned some of them. The Blues Busters, Alton Ellis, um, Higgs and Wilson, the Blues Busters. Alton Ellis was a dancer before, right? Yeah, he was a, you know. Tell me that story. No, in Trenchtown. Alton is from Trenchtown. Mm -hmm. And Trenchtown is the magical place. Of music. I always wonder what, what kind of water was at the standpipe that makes so many people from Trisho be hey. so talented. I want to go into that, but tell me yeah. about Alton Ellis as the dancer well, first. Well, a, a few people know this that before Alton sang, he was just known in Trisho as a dancer. What kind of dances were going on? Oh, legs. Oh, oh. Legs. Legs, yeah. Oh, what, what do you mean, legs? Legs. Legs, go? <laughs> legs like. Just Shuffling, right. nice, nice foot. Your foot had to be well <laughs> oiled. You make all of these moves, and yeah. oh, you know, you had the famous dancers, the Bop Mr. Legs, you know, Pampa Man Gloria. Pampa you Man know. Gloria. Yeah, and yeah, you had quite a bit of dancers, you know, yeah. Castro. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh gosh, I can't remember those guys, but a lot of dancers. So just like today, Pluggy dancing. and Beryl was famous. Uh -huh. Pluggy and Beryl. Pluggy and Beryl. Yeah. These people, wow. okay, you see like how you would have maybe, I don't know how dance all really work, but These you days. have a certain time at night mm -hmm. when somebody enters and you know a person has entered. Yeah. Well, when these dancers, these dancers wait until a certain time of night and they enter, you stop dancing. Oh, oh and yeah. you let them take the oh, floor. Oh, yeah, everybody just make a circle. Oh, so that's still happening today, so it's nothing new. Right. I okay. love it. Oh, my Lord. Oh, yeah. You have so much. I mean, I just want to pick your brain yeah. right uh, yeah, now. Yeah, and these guys are proud. They don't take drinks from people and, oh, oh. It, you know, oh. yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, come on. Well, that was the order of the day in dancing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Retrospectively, Jamaica music. Tommy Cohen, so much history, so yeah. much knowledge, so much experience that you've had. We're going to keep staying in the studio you with me. Bless indeed. I mean, we could do five hours, couldn't we? And, and beyond. Boy, <laughs> we're going to do it. I got to get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up.
so many great people come from Trenchtown. Um, Tommy Cohen, Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Alton Ellis. And it's not that they come from Trenchtown, but they end up in Trenchtown. Yeah. Bunny Wheeler. Um, uh, Delroy Wilson. God, let me help. Let me work with me. Work yeah, with me. Jimmy Tucker. Wailing Soul. Joe Higgs. Higgs um, and Wilson. Hartens uh, Ellis. Okay. I mean, you, you mentioned know. Jimmy Tucker earlier. Um, the, the Heptones, Levi Sibbles. There's so many. Yeah. What 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 was it about Trenchtown as this cultural mecca? I mean, what was going on? Yeah, I think um, coming from the countryside myself and um, getting into Kingston, the first um, singer I got to meet face to face really was a guy called Jimmy Tucker, mm. and Jimmy Tucker was from Trenchtown, but Jimmy Tucker was our best known tenor and I'm um, kind of a, a practic a practic yes. you know. mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, learned so much. You know what was happening in Trenton was such a magic. So I was living on Delacree Road and um, my other partners live like on Maxwell Avenue and Linders Road. And yet still we chose we're still in the to, west of Kingston here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We chose to go into Trenchtown to do our rehearsal. You know, I always wonder about, about that. Why will we, we leave and go there? And at that time, we were actually rehearsing outside of Rita's Gate. Rita Marley's Gate? Yeah, oh. and this was before we knew about Bob Marley. Oh. Right, because I knew Rita before Bob. Yeah, I used to, I used to take her books from her and oh. walk her down from Crossroads to her house. Oh. I was such a gentleman. You were. <laughs> but Trenchtown, what was happening? We, I heard of Jimmy Tucker. And then they, they, they were having like um, the Veer John's concerts, the Veer John's Opportunity Hour, and that took place at the Ambassador Theatre. Tell us about Veer John Opportunity. This was this is a significant point in our history where a lot of people got a bus, as we'd say. They got a chance to shine. They yeah. got a chance to showcase their talent. Who and what was Veer John? Why? And I was not allowed to go to, to these, but we oh. all knew of it. Okay. You know, because we hear the kids and we hear the people talk who were at, um, as a matter of fact, there was a lady living down our street and her son was Hugh Francis. Mm -hmm. And we remember sitting and, and listening when his, his mother and his grandmother wanted him to compete with um, Jimmy Tucker and f figuring a way how to beat Jimmy Tucker. He had to learn to sing in Italian. And so this was the kind of why trench down itself cannot be looked at as really, Trenchtown was really more um, upper mind, uh, upper class in the people's mind. Because for instance, the Ambassador Theatre, the same ambassador, where you had Jimmy Tucker and all these guys competing, was the same place they had like sold out um, showings of the Student Prince. Now, The Student Prince was a famous movie starring okay. Mario Lanza. It was opera. And it for many nights at the at the ambassador. I think they should restore the ambassador. Mm. You just can still see the theater designs inside of it and all of that. Yes. But and exactly where is it? Where, where is the ambassador theater for those who? Um, there's a, that main street when you're going down Trenchtown. Yes. Um, where it's divided, and you go straight down this. It's all the way down. Now, I know the structure is still there. Yeah. Can it? With what's going on in Jamaica and I. Can it be um, can it be revamped? I think so because you see right beside there you have you have um, in, in that whole Trenchtown community you know you have Boys Town, which was founded by um, Hugh Sherlock, Father mm -hmm. Hugh Sherlock, many years ago. As a matter of fact, this year is seventy years since um, he, he had Boys Town. But out of there, there was a vibe because not only that you had the sportsmen, you had like Collie Smith. Who was a cricketer, cricketer, right? You had our first great boxers of Bunny Grant and Percy Hills, who were boxers who went to international fame. Yeah, yeah. right? You see Alton Ellis singing, To be a champion, you got to be a gentleman. That's where he Like got, Mr. Uh, Bunny Grant. Okay. Oh, dance crashers. Oh. That was where that came from. I you had see? no idea, but now, yeah. now I get it. So, <laughs> All around in that place was that there, vibrancy. Yeah, from sports to music, yeah. the theater, the movies. Yeah, it's an it's, it's, it's amazing place. You know, this is one place that I think 
they had everything they had the, the schools they had the play fields they had the drama they had the music but they didn't have a police station did they need a police they station didn't need it wow this is just to show you that's why Bob Marley said, this is Trenchtown Rock. Don't mm. watch that. <laughs> mm. Tell me more about Trenchtown. Well, like I said, you had all these artists coming out of, mm. of Trenchtown. Mm. And, um, uh, and, and this really formed the, that kind of a foundation upon which lies the musical heritage, mm. you know? Um, and... Yeah. I was going to say, what about the recording studios in Trenchtown or in downtown Jamaica? What are the different no. recording studios that stem from out of Trenchtown? No, they didn't have recording studios. Okay. Actually, you had like um, at the bottom of Max Avenue, there was a recording studio. And of course, you had Duke Reed and you had Coxon's. Coxon was where everybody would come right up and, um, and record out from Trenchtown. Mm -hmm. So that Coxon was real demand. What you had was the sound system influences in there, you know? Um, we had Duke oh. and Coxon's and, and all of these different ones. Yeah. Well, well, explain to us the sound system. Nowadays, we see the young DJs or disc jocks or selectors playing music from their laptop. And, you know, tell us about a sound system in those days. What were they playing from? How did it work? What kind of songs were they playing? We're talking about the 70s and the 80s. Ah, uh, well, sound systems played, um, you know, a variety of music. They, they were usually playing a lot of, I think our music had something to do with the American rhythm and blues. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that, you hear of people like Ross Gordon and all of those people. They, 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 a lot of their music would be played. Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, Duke Reed, you know, Duke Reed, the, his, um, his theme song was My Mother's Eyes. Mm -hmm. One bad and da -da -da, that showed me wrong from right. I said in my mother's eyes. No, that's Duke. That was his theme so song. So he would play that coming in at the dance. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And um, but then the dance again was really the the place of you know society in, in the sense of people really dress up and go to the dance wow. and really show their dancing skills yes, yes. i guess it's just a, a movement now that's different that we probably don't understand too much but you know it would show how much you could was and okay. you could do all of that yeah show your dancing skills i have in front of me a musical celebrities from french town trench town rock don't watch that we're talking about a map I have never seen anything like this, and I really believe that this should be published across the world. Explain to me what this map is. Okay, this is a map um, explaining what really happened in Trenchtown and who were the folks that lived here. As a matter of fact, you see from 1 to 30, and it would say number one was where Bob Marley lived, two, Peter Tosh, Bonnie Whaler. So, it is actually a map of the roads and the streets, first street, second street, third street, and so forth. And it showed where all of these artists lived. Wow. And so in the commemoration of um, the 70th um, anniversary of Boys Town, I think they're going to make this map available. I mean, this is almost exclusive to you right now. Yeah. Right. So just to give you a few, you, you, you see where you had the whalers, of course, Delroy Wilson, mm -hmm. You had Joe Higgs, Lord Tanamo, Jimmy Tucker, Junior Tucker, um, Ernie, Ernie Wrangling, Wrangling Dean you know me, Fraser. Cynthia Slush, Slush yes. you know, Lassels Perkins, um, Alton Ellis, um, Darby Dobson, um, and, and so forth. So it's just to show you the wealth of, of talent, musical talent that was entrenched now. Wow, where they were. Um, yes. We have the trench shown all the school here. Right. Ambassador Theatre right, right here. Um, the UNIA building. building yeah. I'm going to bring that up because emancipate yourself from mental slavery. A lot of people think Bob penned that line, but oh. Harvey wrote it first. That's right. And it's very interesting. I want to know, I mean, how, how was Bob Marley when it comes to to Marcus Garvey? Did he read a lot of Garvey? Was he following Garvey? How did that connection You know, I work? said to Bob one day, one day, we, we really, we had an, 
argument about a song mm -hmm. back in younger days. And Bob thought that I heard him singing a song and I started singing this song. Mm -hmm. It's a song called Cool Night. So we had an argument about it. So when we made up on all of that, I said to Bob, I said, tell me something. Explain to me how you write your songs. I'm saying, I just go down to Auntie Bar. I say, Rum Bar. And I just sit back and I listen. And the people them are talk. Yes. And they're talking. So when they hear who the cap fit, let them wear it. These are talks that he used to just listen. And what would happen in Trenchtown, you know, amongst the, the brethren, I believe, was a lot of, of, of talk. A lot of things about black power. A lot of things about Garvey. A lot of things about Selassie. A lot of things about Martin Luther King, um, Eldridge Cleaver, Ma uh, Malcolm X, you know? Mm -hmm. and all of that. That was a lot of the talk that would happen on Maxwell Avenue and I imagine also in Trenchtown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and Garvey was really, I mean, Garvey was always the seat of people like Bob's conversation and Martin McClana, mm -hmm. you know, who he, you know, Bob really sat around these guys a lot and got a lot of knowledge from them. So I, I think it was just a natural to know about who Marcus Garvey is because these, um, in, you know, from Trenchtown, there was really a lot of black pride. Mm, mm. Yeah. And is you feel it's still there today in Trenchtown? Do you think Trenchtown could capitalize more on its history as being oh, the think, cultural, the, the cultural place to come when you definitely reach Definitely not capitalizing on the on the, the history. history of it. I think it's um it's something we have missed by miles in the whole development. I mean, Trenchtown should be one of the places people come from all over the world just to tour. We should um, really uh, make sure that these heritage sites and so forth, that they, they, you know, they are kept and people could come and see it. Mm. As a matter of fact, they have something similar to, to the whole Trenchtown experience in Florida. You know, I think at Disney, with that whole Bob Marley experience, okay. you can walk in. Yes, and, and they've yeah. done, I think, so, is it Sidella or uh, d some of his, is it some of his children have also recorded some Disney songs, right? Right, but, no, but they have like a replica of a part of Trenchtown. No, we need to and, be doing you know, more with it. Why aren't we doing more with our cultural heritage? I think because um, for some reason, whatever the reason is, um, places like Trenchtown became... Um, a spot where people started to look down on and thinking, well, okay, it's a sort of a Thai, what you call inner city, and you start the Thai ghetto. And that is why we have an opportunity now to look back. That's why I say, when you look at Trenchtown, and this was where they were, were, were clamoring over things like the student prints. This is where people like Jimmy Tucker came from, Lascelles Perkins, and these guys who were really no fake singers, these guys were real mm -hmm. and singing from we would probably consider today to be the upper class if you want to look at it that way where only people of intelligence and whatever would want to sit back and listen to opera, you know, this is what was in Trenchtown. Stigma has changed. Yeah, yeah. We're going to talk so much more about your musical journey, Jamaican musical journey. Tommy Cohen, you're a blessing. It's memory lane. It's memory lane. We're here with Tommy Cohen inside the studio talking about your songwriting skills. A man of many talents. Wow. Share with us some of the songs that you have penned. Okay. Um, there's some of the early ones. It's called like Manpa. Manpa. <laughs> what year was that? 
back in the day. All right, we're going to play that in the background right now. We're going to turn on a little mom. Let me turn on mom, pa. I know, Vicky. Back in the day. We're going to turn on mom, pa. Uh, back in the day. All right, let's listen to that. All the songs. Was before the tape recorder was invented. <laughs> before but the anyway. tape recorder was invented? Anyway. But I we had that man, pa, um, sing freedom. But songs you know most, I think. Things you say you love, you're going to lose. Baba Boom. Baba Peace Boom. and love. That was um, a big one. How did that do? Which Baba Boom? Yeah. Oh man, that's amazing. Yeah, and that was a big tune. I mean, even right now, it was chosen by a company over in Europe to be like the promotion of a song. So good things come to those. You know, they say, um, <laughs> <laughs> don't those be scared of time. Wait. <laughs> Just let's wait and be patient. Things, things of quality have no fear of time. That's say, no. true. Okay. Okay. Um, sing Freedom. I, I wrote songs for Jacob Miller. Uh, if you remember, All Night Till Daylight. Okay. Um, I did some songs for Carleen too. Yes. Santa Claus, Do Ever Come to the Ghetto. You say Carleen like this is somebody that you just wrote for. the wonderful for. Carleen. Who is Carleen, your wife, the beautiful wow. Carleen Davis? Who, I mean, where did you meet her? Oh, that's a story I guess. That's a different <laughs> <laughs> You see how he gets it? He licked his lips. He got excited. Oh, Let's just tell the people, Carleen Davis, your wife. Beautiful woman. Yes. Wow. Wow. Where'd you meet? <laughs> Look at him. I'm blushing all over. <laughs> <laughs> Again. Where did you meet her, Auntie Carleen? Oh gosh, I think I think I, I met her sometime back when I was at Dynamic Sounds and um I, I think I saw her and then one day I went to a concert and I was, I was at a concert and Ernest Smith was performing and I said, wow, the young lady that's doing the backup vocals, she is the star. And I just made sure that I went to meet, meet her. She was at the Hilton Hotel singing mm. and that was it back in the day. 27 years ago, something like that, 28 could be. Wow. Yeah. Now married, yeah. working together a lot. Yeah. Tell us some of the projects that you both have. I mean, she's, we call her Pastor Carleen to know. Oh, yeah. We've gone into the gospel area. Right. You also have a gospel tour as well as Right, we've, the we've done the, um, the gospel train. Um, we now have Fun in the Sun, which is... Um, Pulls up to what? A hundred thousand people. This is a this is a, a, a tour that you do. Fun in the sun. No, it's is not a, a tour. It's a it's one, a one location, event. one event. Yeah. But the gospel train. You gospel went to train. Different areas. Every every parish across mm -hmm. the island. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And what year did that start? The gospel train. A gospel train was back in ninety eight. Okay. Yeah. And that went on for how long? And that went on for two years. Mm -hmm. And. Um, and then in 2002, we started Fun, in the, uh, Fun in the Sun. And then we did other things, Gospel Sunset, we did the Negro shows, we did the Demby events. You Tell know. us what um, the Fun in the Sun concert is really about. It's really about the transformation of lives, mm. of young people's lives. Each year we have hundreds of young people who come and they're converting. They give their lives to the Lord, mm. um, want to change. We have over 500 youths that are trained to deal with them in peer evangelism. And, um, and what we do, we have an all-day event, um, which has a children's village. It has various booths all around, which we call the Sun Village. And then we and sometimes we have extreme sports in it. Um, sometimes we have normal sports, as cricket, football, and so forth. And then we close the evening off with a massive concert. <coughs> Sorry, the last time we had um, Kirk Franklin close off our concert and it was massive. We used two football fields at Jamaica College for that. Wow, this comes from, I mean, the success of Fun in the Sun comes from your experience in events such as Sun Splash and right. all the other events that you just name them for me real quick. Right, yeah. But it's, it, it comes out of my experience, but right. it's, it's, it's a God call. Of course, I know, yeah, I know. But even running but a Sun successful Splash, event, I know the mission. Sun Splash, but which I, mm -hmm. I was known as the voice of Sun Splash yes. for many years. Yes. And of course, I, I also started Sting yes. with Leng. Wow. Yes, Leng trying to lock me up one day. And out of it comes Sting. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Tell me that no, story. Go with that no, now. just give it to me real quick. <laughs> Please. Leng, I didn't mean to do this No, here, we sir. need to know. This is funny. I, I mean, this is history <laughs> and we're going to document it right now in the studio. No, and we're going to go back um, <laughs> to Fun in the Sun and some of the movements that yeah. you're involved with now yeah. and how your life has transformed right. uh, with your beautiful wife as well. But tell me, 
Lang tried to lock you up. Oh, listen. I mean, break it. Break uh, it. Break I, I, it I just give you a quick story quickly. Mm -hmm. I was coming from the country mm -hmm. and um, uh, we had just done Small World with, with the, the Mali, Ziggy and them and all of mm -hmm. that. They were kids and I was doing the Small World thing. Yeah. So I was driving back from the country and this cop. I didn't know it was a cop trying to stop me. And I said, no guy's going to stop me. And then, so he rode me down on his motorbike and two then of them. Then was a cop? Yes. <laughs> and then we went into <laughs> to, um, to uh, Linstead and all of that. And they took us to the police station, you know, search us and, you know, and charged me for indecent language and so forth. Oh, Uncle Tom. Oh, could I do that? Mm. And so, um, but out of a long story, you know, we met. And then he says, okay, then you couldn't tell me who you are, man. <laughs> so, so you're fierce, you know. But, <laughs> and then out of that came Sting. Sting. Yeah. Wow, one night show. Yeah. How many years has Sting been going? Oh, uh, Sting is over. Uh, oh gosh, oh. Because we're in 2010. Ten years now. and beyond now. Yeah. Yeah. One of the greatest one night dance shows. Right, shows. right. Um, your transformation from the more secular and Rastafari world, moving now into the gospel world and, and doing the same thing. It's music, record label, it's product, everything that you're doing in that world you're doing now in the gospel world with your beautiful wife, Carlene David. Uh, where did the transformation begin? I think I think uh, it, it went over a period of time with my children first. Mm -hmm. um, my son, Pastor Chen, and Pastor Sarah, they're both pastors now. And um, they, they were in the church basically. And um, and then, of course, you know, my father was also a pastor, Methodist pastor. When I came from New Market, I came from New Market Methodist Church. But, and then, um, and then, my my whole walk through Rastafari with Bob and Skill Cole and all that. But you know, Skill was always on about Christ. You know, Skill Cole? and the twelve tribes of Israel believed in Jesus Christ as yes, your Lord do. and Savior. Real quick, a lot of people would know who Skill Cole is from being a great footballer. I mean, to being on the road and also penning some songs for with Bob. Bob. Yeah, yeah. Tell yeah, us man. a little little snippet. Well, uh, Skill was Bob's Skill like Bob's best friend, and yeah. but I knew Skill before even then. Mm -hmm. I knew him from Vineyard Town and all of that because we're just friends because I used to just clown all over the place and he was a young footballer. Yes. But we, we, we went to the same places together. And I used to go to his house as a, as a kid. So, you know, Skill, Skill is a great teacher and a, has a great brain. Mm -hmm. And I always had, you know, trying to find where they hold Selassie influence and why Selassie believed so much in Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and the, the various teachings. Selassie was but a Christian. But in 1996, mm -hmm. Carly and my wife got diagnosed with cancer mm, and true. and it, it brought about a difference because she saw herself at a, a point where there was no way to go and then she says you know you know I'm going to just give it to the Lord I'm gonna give everything to him and that was it and immediately as she got um, over her cancer I got diagnosed and here I was with this thing in my stomach, which was kind of just amazing. And I went into the doctors. They said, okay, what they saw in there was dangerous. It could be cancerous. And um, they needed to get it, but they couldn't get it out because they couldn't get it all out. So what they would have had to do is to do a laser treatment. So I went in, that cut my stomach open and they closed me up back. I said I had to come back now for a second surgery mm. and they would have to do it by laser because if they did not do it by laser I would have had to walk with a bag they would have had to remove my stomach and I got at that time you know we got Pastor David Keane and the elders of the church and they came and they prayed and I went through quite a thing in that hospital I mean, the place got dark. It was a, it was a spiritual warfare. Mm. But at the end of it, when they went in to do the surgery, they did not see what, they, what was there before. And I knew that God then had done a miracle. And I say, you know, you don't go through that 
for just, you know, and I realized that there was this calling on my life. And I decided then and there that we would just go full time, wherever God directs us, that's where we will go. Beautiful. And yeah. you're definitely doing great things now. What's the name of the record label that you have now? Oh, Glory Music. Glory Music. Mm -hmm. And the main artist would be Carly? Yes. And um, we, we, we get involved in, in, in various events, whether they be in Jamaica or abroad or evangelism right across the Caribbean. We have been across the Caribbean um, evangelizing. Uh, meeting most of the leaders, praying with the leaders mm. for peace in their country. And um, it's really been a joy. You know, it's so amazing that you can fit in anywhere still today. You can fit in with the young people. You can fit in with the elders. You can fit in into the secular world. You can fit into Rasta world, fit into the gospel world still today. Let me ask you, what is it about you, Uncle Tommy? Well, the thing about it, you know, you learn <laughs> <laughs> that... You are out, out here to love. Love is, is, is really the, the basics, is the roots of all, everything. If, if, if you have love in your roots, it will show in your fruits. Oh, I love that. Love in your you know? roots, it will show in your fruits. What's a favorite song? What's your favorite song of all time? It has to be a Jamaican song. <laughs> <laughs> you are my favorite Jamaican yes. song. Yes. No, but it has, yeah, your favorite song should be a Jamaican song. Okay, yeah, your favorite Jamaican song of all time. My favorite Jamaican song of all time is really, because it meant so much to me, is, is a line that Bob Marley has in a song that says, Give us the teachings of His Majesty, for we don't want the devil's philosophy. Ooh, I like that. All right, next question for you now. You yeah. ready? What is the craziest thing you've ever done in the music business? You sure you want to share that with us? <laughs> craziest thing ever. Are you ready wow. to go back there? <laughs> wow. Go on, I must say something. Wow. There's so many crazy things. The music <laughs> business is crazy. It's crazy. Give me one that you just say, oh my. Lord, why did I do that? Oh, I, I think, um, oh my gosh. Mm. Are we ready for this, people? This is hard. Okay, it's got to be one. Oh my gosh, this is too tough. Yeah, all right. Um, you want me to switch it? Yes. Okay, what about the most embarrassing moment? Oh man, dropping on my bottom in front of over 25,000 people. Where was this? In the United States. Wow. And I was dancing and backing up and went mm -hmm. right onto the monitor behind me. And dropped. And the crowd went, no, I went like this. Okay. The crowd went, ooh. And I went <laughs> forward and said, ooh, ooh. And then, ooh. Oh Boom. Lord. One of the most embarrassing things was also walking into a concert in, um, San Francisco and thought to myself that the entire um, California was the LA Lakers and it was during the time and I went up there and said you know everybody for the Lakers say yeah and everybody says boo <laughs> <laughs> that would have been embarrassing I hope that's not documented you know. let me ask you though if there is one word that you could use to describe Jamaican music what would it be and I know we're talking about many Infectious. different genres. Infectious. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to young people out there that would like to enter the business? Um, I would say make sure that this is what you want to do. You have to, 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 to spend time to do it properly. You have to be disciplined. What got Bob Marley to where he, he got wasn't really all about his talent was really about his discipline. You better believe this guy was disciplined. Never late, always on time, respects his audience, respect the people in the business. Mm. Yeah. Tommy Cohen, our uncle, our father, our godfather, our Jamaican son, when we're talking about the history of Jamaican music. Thank you so much for sharing with us your experience. I enjoyed it. Bless. And